This is Prime Sports IndyCar on the Prime Sports Network. I'm Greg DePama. He's CJ Radoon. And that is Eric Smith live from the Brickyard in Indianapolis, his uh, home base. How's it going, Eric? It looks beautiful. It is. Great day. Um, this would be prime uh, video location for a car base. So maybe next year, we got to remember this because uh, normally behind me, there would be several thousand uh, drunk people, probably uh, some jello shots, um, probably some people passed out around me. Um, this is definitely Carb Day uh, watching material spot, if you know what I mean. But uh, today, there's nobody here. That's that's kind of been the story of the, the month. No fans. Um, just kind of felt like a different Carb Day today because of that. It's just practice session and done. Um, so, yeah, so far, so good, though. Glad to be here. And, and we don't have to worry about any tire controversy as far as the IndyCar series is concerned. That's something that we'll talk about next week. Uh, so, you know, we have Firestone with IndyCar and Goodyear with NASCAR, correct? That's correct. Yep. And uh, have you heard anything about that, by the way, hanging around there? Is, is, are, is anybody talking about it? Nobody's talking about it. They, they typically stay in their own lane here. Um, the only thing here that you, you'd see a crossover with NASCAR is Jimmy Johnson's interest of doing this. Um, I think it's going to happen next year for him, which would be a different story for a different day. But other than that, they don't speak a lot of NASCAR over here. Um, like Penske or Ganassi would be good guys to talk to. But um, Penske is a busy man, obviously, owning this track now in the series. I haven't really seen him on his golf cart a few times. Uh, and Ganassi kind of sticks to himself here. So uh, those would be probably the top two people you can get to talk to about it if you can pin him down. But um, that probably won't be till race day if anything happens. All right. Now, uh, a couple things. And then I'm also going to uh, – CJ, I'm going to let you uh, jump in here. I'm sure you have some questions for Eric as well. Uh, talk about last year the winner of the race uh, – Pagano won from the pole. He was the first driver to win from the pole uh, since 2009. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Now, uh, so that, that's not a good sign for Marco Andretti, or maybe it is. Maybe it's a new trend that will start because Marco Andretti, who has not had good performances here in the last few years, uh, but did have a nice run uh, not too long ago where he was contending in the top five, in the top ten, He's got the name, but now he's the second choice because he's on the pole at six to one. So there's a little bit of pressure now on Marco Andretti, but I guess it can't be a bad thing because uh, he's never been in this situation before. Maybe that'll be what he needs, which obviously means he's got a fast car. He does. I, I He's my pick. He, he's my pick. I just wrote about it before I came on the show, uh, my top five uh, finishers, and he's my pick. I just feel like, and he's my pick a lot here. He's, he, this is his best track on the schedule. Um, it just seems like it, I, I guess I shouldn't have picked him because the one year I don't pick him, he would actually win. Uh, so I'm sorry, Marco, uh, if you listen to this, I jinxed you. But uh, um, but he's had the jinx here, the Andretti curse. It's been around since decades. But he noted in his uh, media availability yesterday that maybe the Andretti curse doesn't live in August. Maybe it's just the May thing. He, he had a very fast car here all month i mean other than today he's the top three uh he's been in the top three in practice literally every session i think this year it seems like he's more determined uh than he's ever been and he's mentioned that that all this past failures all the past mistakes all the haters that he says people are like oh andretti sucks he's he's 28th again well he's learned from all of that and you it showed I, I asked him yesterday about on qualifying that fourth lap he said all last week it's going to come down the fourth lap, going to come down to the fourth lap, going to come down to the fourth lap. Well, last Sunday it came down to the fourth lap, and he he got the pole. I mean, he he prevailed. He won the pole on that last lap, and that's something I don't think Marco would have done a few years ago. The pressure might have got to him. He's uh, he's had, had his grandpa Mario in his ear, and um, he's confident. He's quiet. He just seems more determined, and I think this is his year. He said yesterday he's happy with his race car. Um, the car is dialed in. It's there. That's why I think maybe today the speed chart wasn't indicative on, on what he had. Um, he just seemed like maybe they're testing stuff out today. Just, Hey, if you get in traffic, maybe let's try this or let's try that. So 
Um, I like him. I think this is his year. Um, six to one, still pretty good to get him at for being a pole winner. Track position means more here than it has in recent years. So uh, I think this is Marco's year. Yeah, but what about the racing, CJ? What do you think we're going to see? As as Eric kind of indicated, do, do you think that we're going to see? Because normally, you know, the racing is a little bit more exciting than we get at NASCAR. Uh, but there have been some races recently that haven't been as exciting. We're talking about a lot of lead changes and so forth. What do you think we're going to see this year? I think it's going to be a little bit more cagey. Uh, I haven't been in as many of the media sessions as Eric has been being on site, but the ones that I have been in, every single driver has been talking about uh, how you're going to have to have more patience to pass. Not that it can't be done, uh, but the way that the cars are this this year with the aero screen and the way that they're handling in traffic, you're just going to have to be a little bit more uh, planful in, in where you're going to get your passes done. They're not exactly sucking up and being able to say, all right, this corner is my opportunity. I'm going to go for it. Uh, rather, it takes a couple of laps for them to plan, time it out and, and get it done. So I do think the more determined drivers who think that they've got a good car that probably didn't see the speed that they wanted to see on qualifying or in qualifying are going to be a little bit more aggressive at the front. They're going to be trying to make their way through the field. And I think we'll see some passes in there at the early parts. Um, I wonder for some of the guys who don't have as much experience as they're in the field, um, if we may see some more mistakes, a little bit more impatience and things like that happening. Uh, but I, I think you're going to see passes. I don't think you're going to see nearly as many as we have in the past. I think the arrow screen kind of messes that up. And I just think you're going to see a little bit more cagey uh, strategic race until you get probably to those last 50 to 30 laps. Talk a little bit about uh, this arrow screen, Eric. It doesn't sound like a good thing to me. Uh, it's, it's great for safety. Um, I, I didn't like it when it first was announced. Like, man, I, I just used to the traditional open wheel, open, open cockpit car. I could say in person, you don't really notice it. You don't notice it at speed here. Um, it kind of looks cool from the side, almost looks like a, a fighter, a jet, a jet pilot like type thing, but, uh, or fighter jets the way I'm looking for. Um, but I, yeah, it, like CJ said, it, it creates, I think we might see more action in the top two or three than we've seen in the past, only because it creates more drag, which means it's slowing the car down. like a, It's like a parachute bringing you back to the car behind you. And they said up front you can pass easier because of that. But fourth on back, it, it does create a lot of dirty air. And if you're not in that bubble, um, what they've talked about, it's hard to break into that bubble because it's just the quote-unquote bubble of, of, of dirty air back there. Um but I do think, like CJ said, it's going to be tough to pass, but it doesn't mean they can't pass. It's just you're going to have to be more strategic. And I feel like the starting lineup helps us for this. I mean, you look at row 8 to row 10. I wrote about this. You got six Indy 500 wins among four drivers, a two-time world champion in F1, and they're all starting there. Those guys all said, I talked to them yesterday, uh, about the start of the race, about do you go? Do you know this being a track position race? Do you have to charge hard? And does it give you a little more comfort that you've got some good big name guys around you? It's not usually back there. It's for a lot of rookies or second year drivers that are just getting up to speed. Not this year. You got a lot of big name guys back there. And they all said, no, nah, I'm comfort. I'm a little worried about some of the one off guys because they're going to make their moves. But I think we just let them go because we know our cars are good on the long run. We know how to dial it in to get to the front. So I think you might it might work out for us that, yes, up front, you might see some changing of the lead. You might see, like, fifth through tenth. Uh, nah, they're not – they're kind of single file. But then maybe tenth or eleventh on back is going to get wild because you're going to have those those big heavy hitters. You know they're going to make their way to the front eventually, and they're just going to strategically pick guys off one by one. Um, they said restarts will be wild. I don't know how many restarts we're going to get only because – the class of this field from top to bottom is so good. You're not going to see a lot of guys make mistakes other than on restarts, but we have to get a caution to get to the restart first. So I think it's going to be one of those races that it's going to be fun. Um, hopefully TV shows the whole field and doesn't just focus on the top few guys. I think you're going to see a lot of passing behind. Um, then they might stall out, but pit, pit position, pit, uh, pit's going to be big here. Uh, I talked to Sage Karam yesterday, made a very good point about this, that, Yes, it's going to be tough to pass. Pit road is where you make this up. Um, a good pit stop, you're going to come out obviously ahead of guys that had bad, but the on and out or in and out laps are really going to be a factor here because you can push it as hard as you can 
all the way up to that pit limit, which in IndyCar, they've got a button. They're not, you're not going to see a lot of uh, pit road speeding penalties like we see in NASCAR. It's like, oh, come on. This guy doesn't deserve to have a penalty. Uh, IndyCar hits a button and it slows him down. So you're not going to see pit stop penalties uh, for um, in terms of speeding. You might have like a tire or, okay. or uh, too many guys over. Um, but they're going to push the limit getting on the pit road. Then they're going to have to push the limit getting off the pit road. Um, so you might catch a, a lucky draft, like he was saying, on the back stretch. There may be somebody that come out in front of you, and you could tow behind them, which is going to make your out lap quicker than somebody else. And you may make up some spots that way too. So strategy is going to be key. Big names in the back moving their way forward. And you got some big names up front that aren't going to want to go back either. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a fun race because of that. So the aero screen does change things. Um, but it's not the that's really the, the end okay. of the world because of it either. Now, uh, back to Pagano, CJ, uh, he, his win was the ninth straight win by a different driver. Uh, so we've had nine uh, different winners of the Indy 500 straight winners of the Indy 500. And yet two of the favorites, the top two favorites have never won the Indy 500. Uh, do you take, what do you take into that nine consecutive different winners of this race? I take, I take it to be a very hard race. <laughs> it's 500 miles over an ever-changing, extremely difficult track. It, this isn't a, a NASCAR track. I mean, it is a NASCAR track, and we talk about how boring it is. But for these guys, it's flat out for them. So every shift in the wind, every temperature degree change um, on the surface affects them greatly. The traffic, the positioning of other cars affects them greatly. Every single turn for them is different. And you, it's a 2.5-mile track with four turns, um, so you go 200 laps. That's a long way that you've got to be perfect and you've got to be fast. It is an extremely difficult race with multiple pit stops. Uh, strategy comes into play. Pretty much everything that is difficult about racing resides right here at Indianapolis or right there where Eric's sitting at Indianapolis. <laughs> um, so I think the Indy is very selective in who it allows to win. Uh, it is no surprise to me that nine straight um, Indy 500s have been won by somebody different. The most wins anybody has in the Indy 500 is is four, and that's happened what four times. So it, it's it, it's a really difficult race to win. It's a really difficult race to win multiple times. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that if you haven't won that you're better off in terms of the odds. I would still go with experience. Um, but, um, you know, experience knows how to get you to, to victory lane once, but it may not tell you how to get there this particular weekend. you got to have a lot of luck on your side as well. Eric, the favorite, Scott Dixon, has got three wins on the year. He will be right there second uh, behind uh, Marco. He hasn't been able to win the 500. Matter of fact, he doesn't have a whole lot of good results at the 500 is this like his nemesis track and if it is when you're in this series you do not want the brickyard as your nemesis track no you don't and he has won here before you want to know wait um but he hasn't won since i mean you look at all those tries he's had here uh this is his nemesis almost you look at all the success he's had away from here 49 wins and he's got one win here in the 500. And really, if you even count the road course race out here, the one that he won here in July uh, was his first time winning on the road course. So out of 49 wins, 47 of them are outside of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And what's weird is an IndyCar, you're, it's, you know, most sports, you're, you're, you're looked at of how many Super Bowl trophies you've won or how many World Series, how many NBA Finals, how many, how many championship trophies you have. Here in IndyCar, it's more of how many Indy 500 wins do you have? It's not necessarily about the championships. Dixon's got five championships. He's good everywhere. He's got one Indy 500. And I've asked him about that. Like, do you feel like you need another 500 win? I mean, because the guy he's being judged upon is like A.J. Foyt, seven championships. He's won four times here. Dixon's got five. I think he can catch Foyt. This might be his sixth championship this season. But to have one Indy 500 win, it, it definitely stings. I mean, that's... For whatever reason, if anything can go wrong here, it does for him. Um, the year he started on the pole here, um, 2017, he uh, he won the pole. And um, he goes to Taco Bell just down the street that night, and he gets robbed in the drive-thru. Um, 
And then in the race, uh, a slower car, Jay Howard, comes down in turn one right in front of him while he's leading, by the way, hits his tire and flies in the air like an airplane going off. Luckily, he somehow wasn't injured other than like, I don't know if he broke his ankle, hurt his ankle. Never fully said he was limping on crutches. But then he goes to Detroit a week later and wins there. So So uh, sort of like a, a young player that has a superstar career ahead of him wins the Super Bowl, say, in football, and thinks, hey, this is going to be easy. I should have about four or five of these before my career is over. And he's looking back, and I I haven't been able to win one since. Yeah, kind of compared to, I guess, would say like like the opposite of a Peyton Manning. Like Manning had all those regular season stats but one Super Bowl. So imagine Dixon with all those Super Bowls, but – but count the Super Bowl as like the regular season too, though. But having one, like it's like he doesn't have regular season success in the biggest race. I, it's just baffling. Um, this year looks to be like his best year. You would think that he's had in a while. In every practice session, counting today, he was in the top three. He was second today. He starts second. We raced on the Super Speedway earlier this year in Texas. He started second. He led over 150 laps out of the 200 and won. So the numbers are aligning for him, but it's just it's hard for his odds to go all in on him because it just seems like for whatever yeah. reason, something always happens to him. Yeah, um, four to one's a low number thinking, for, for a driver yeah, that's, that's had that's a lot like, of issues at this track for many years. Yeah. Who, who would be, that's, that's like Kevin Hart. Who, who would you uh, first you CJ, who, who would you say is the one driver that's never won here besides Andretti? Which driver? Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's new garden, but give me a driver that is, he hasn't won here, right? New garden. Okay, nope. give yes, me a uh, driver. Who's the top driver that's never won here? Um, Current driver, in active. Time or just in the field. <laughs> uh, uh, geez. Um, I mean, there are a lot of them, so I'm scrolling lot, through the list really? here. I mean, who would, you, who would you say, Eric? I probably would say at this moment, in terms of active guys that haven't won here, would be a new guard. He's won two of the last three series championships. He's... His stats are aligning with Dixon, as oddly as it sounds. After At this point of Dixon's career, just mirror it to where Newgarden is now, uh, Dixon had 19 wins, Newgarden has 17. Dixon had two championships, Newgarden has two championships. Dixon had 31 podiums, Newgarden has 29 podiums. Dixon won the 500 that okay. year, so can Newgarden win the 500 this year? That's It's... It just this doesn't seem like a track that's one of Newgarden's best. But he is, he, is, he has his, been uh, his results have been better here lately. They have. He he enters this this weekend. He was third in the the hundredth running, eighth in twenty eighteen, fourth last year. He starts thirteenth. Um, I asked his former boss Ed Carpenter yesterday in the press conference. Um, he's got a young rookie uh, that kind of reminds everybody of New Garden. Uh, Nineteen years old, went two hundred thirty one miles an hour in qualifying. Um, I asked him, like, does he remind you of Joseph? And he said, actually, I think he's faster than Joseph here. So that tells you he thinks a rookie's faster than Joseph here, that that a lot of people just, this just doesn't seem like one of Joseph's better tracks, which is odd because everywhere else is. So it would be, uh, I guess that's a long-winded okay. answer as far as the guys who haven't won here, the top, I would say New Garden right now. All right. How about, uh, let's see, what uh, as far as these, younger drivers tell me a little bit about uh vk is it rhinus vk rhinus vk Rhinus yeah. vk so yes. he's starting fourth he's 18 to yep. one and i just mentioned him because he's they got the best position and, and odds are are okay i'll start with him but also add in a couple more players and then cj you you'll add in as well some of these uh long shot players, maybe younger drivers with not a lot of experience here that you think might have a chance. Well, VK, I I do feel like he does have a chance. I mean, Ed Carpenter racing's had good cars here over the years. Um, Plus he's a rookie. He's starting fourth. He's got good track position. I think if I were them and I would sense this is probably what they'll do, they'll put a little more downforce on his car early. And that's another thing about any car different than NASCAR. They, they can trim out different levels of downforce. Um, a lot of the guys up front, you, you're going to go lighter on downforce because the lighter you are on downforce, the faster you are. With the clean air, um, it doesn't disturb it as much. You go faster in a straight line. But if you get in heavy traffic, 
the lack of downforce can cause your car to have understeer and you just want to come out from under you and wreck. So for a rookie at the beginning of the race, I would maybe throw on more downforce for him. And like he said yesterday, and I asked him, you know, what's the best advice Ed Carpenter has given you or uh, Ari Leindyke, who's his driver coach, um, another Dutch native. Like he is, he won the 500 twice. And he said, they, they've been banging and banging in my head. This race is 500 miles. It's 200 laps. You're not going to win it on the first lap. Sometimes you just have to let people go, settle in, try to find your strengths over the first 150 laps. So you're there in the last 50 laps. And then you capitalize. He's got a fast race car. You know that some of these guys up front, again, are going to have lighter downforce. Maybe let him go. Maybe let him get their stance on the top 10, because we've seen this. This could be a race of attrition. If guys step out, um, try to aero screen, they step out, they lose their car and they wreck. He could be there. And you have to be there. And like Rick Mears always said, and the, the first or to finish first, yeah. the first must finish. Yeah. Um, so I think he'll be there. He's a guy to, to look, especially for those odds. I would definitely okay. throw some money. CJ. Way. What do you think about uh, Alex Pillow? Um, I, I think the arrows guys have looked the real deal for sure. Um, it, both of them throughout the season. I mean, you just talked about one of them, uh, but both of them have been very fast. What do you think his chances are? Um, pretty much any of the any of the Honda guys. I mean, looking through the the times throughout the entire uh, couple of weeks so far, Honda's been at the top. I don't know if they brought something extra to the table versus Chevrolet, uh, but the the speed is certainly there over some of the Penske cars and, and Chevrolet in particular. Um, though Penske is saying that their race cars are, are really really strong, but as, as far as keeping with the new guys, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on on Polo. He is my top sleeper. Uh, for that reason, I, he's fearless. This guy out here has never been this fast before, never raced on an oval prior to this year, never seen the Indianapolis Motor Speed rather than on TV um, prior to this year. And here he's qualifying at speeds over 230. Um, he said that it, he actually, on the Fast Line shootout, ran the fastest lap of all of qualifying. And he had probably front row pace. His weight jacker broke inside the car, so he couldn't adjust it on his run. And he still qualified seventh. So... He's got good pace. He's one of a couple drivers that was in the top 10 of literally every practice this month. That says something. He's got a good car. Again, um, I would probably go a little heavier on the downforce for him early um, and then tr take off as the race goes on. I think he's going to be there. I, I think he can finish ahead of VK. Honestly, I I I'm he reminds me of like a Carlos Munoz around here. And Carlos Munoz was this was the track um, where we said this isn't a track for New Garden Dixon. For a guy like Munoz over the years, this was his track. That guy was up front every year. I'm shocked he doesn't have a ride here uh, the last couple of years. But uh, Pelot reminds me of him, and I think he's a solid top five guy. And he could steal a win. I would not be shocked if that guy's drinking the milk on Sunday um, just because he had one of those good quiet days and you look up at the end, and there he is. And, and you know too, CJ, Dale Coyne Racing always does weird pitch strategy to find themselves there. At the end, I mean, we saw a guy named Carlos, Carlos Huertas, who I don't think <laughs> is better than like 20th, steal a win in Houston because they pit real early and rain started falling and they never pit again. And there he is with the win. So um, I would not count Pelo, uh out on Sunday. Uh, what about uh, Felix Rosenquist? Well, what, he's at uh, 25 to 1. He's got a win on the season. He'll be starting 14th. I don't like him as much. He, he's not comfortable on ovals. He's mentioned that. He's he's more comfortable this year than he was last year, naturally. Yeah, but, that's a uh, bad sign. I, I just don't – yeah, he he always said last year he wasn't comfortable on ovals, and then he gets to Pocono and runs over the top of uh, Hunter Ray's <laughs> tire from a wreck with Sato. Hey, he warned everybody. Flips in, yeah, he almost flipped into a fence. That, that spooked him. Um, I think he's just going to be real conservative. He's mentioned that he wants to win an IndyCar championship. He won already this year. He's going to be up front. Uh, so I think he's a good, solid top 10 okay. out of him would be good. But in terms of like a, a race win, I just don't see it. He's not as fearless as like a Polo or a VK could be. Um, I think he's just ready for a solid top 10 and just move on to game. All right. Uh, then uh, some quick uh, comments on each of these drivers, uh, starting with UCJ Rossi. Uh, Rossi is determined. I think he's, um, from what I've seen, he's very serious about making sure that he's upfront and smart throughout this race. So I think he's going to be one that you're going to have to contend with at the yeah, end. He has some really good stats here, Eric. Yeah, he uh, three three point five average finish. Finished second last year. I talked to him yesterday, and he said that uh, it sucks to finish second here. He said that he that haunts him 
and his thoughts more than winning here in 16. He is determined. He said his race car is, is better, as good now than it was in the years past, and he was second or third on the speed chart today. So that says a lot. Uh, and he's he is probably, to me, the most fearless driver out here. They say you can't pass on the outside. That dude will pass three cars on the outside if you All let right. him. So, Seven uh, to one. Watch out for Rossi. He's the third yep, choice. That's, that's a great pick to okay, take. Okay, yes. uh, CJ, uh, let's see. Hunter Ray, who will be starting fifth, uh, the 2014 champ. Yeah, a little bit interesting. I, I think aside from, I think Rossi is my favorite, you know, barring um, Andretti out of the Andretti um, team. I, I have, I'm a little bit less excited about Hunter Ray than I would be on Rossi. He just hasn't had the same kind of determination that Rossi has had um, over the past week or so, plus his um, times here in, um, in practice. Um, a little bit concerned. Rossi was third in practice. Hunter Ray is all the way down in 20 seconds. So we know the Andretti team has speed and we know that they have the strategy. They can call the strategies to get it done. But for the past couple of years, Ryan Hunter Ray hasn't, he's shown the speed, but he hasn't really shown the ability to take that finish. So I'm a little bit worried about him. If I were looking at the bunch, I'd go over with, uh, with Rossi on that choice. Oh, and Eric, and we've talked about New Garden, Pagano. What's throwing Hunter Ray, uh, who's eight to one? New Garden and Pagano are ten to one. Out of those three drivers, who would you lean towards? Probably Simon, um, just because we talked about New Garden, and I agree with CJ. I, I felt good about Hunter Ray coming in to, into today, twenty uh, second. I just, I just don't think he's got it compared to Rossi, and he's fearless too. He'll make some moves, but I just don't feel like his race car is as good as Marco or uh, Rossi's. Um, Pagano and everybody's been saying the, the speed chart hasn't been indicative of this, but his car looks great in traffic. I mean, it, he's been everybody's pick, even starting 25th. And, and I asked him yesterday too, he, he started last in Iowa, 23rd, 23 cars in that field. And that race was only 218 miles. And he won. He came from last to the front. He starts 25th Sunday. This race is pretty much double the length of that one. So why can't he win with a good car? And, we know Penske has good pitch strategy, too. So the fact that you can get a defending champion for those odds, I, I would definitely take it. Well, let's actually touch up on that with the stats. What is the farthest back a driver has won the 500? And same question, I guess, regarding recently, like over the last 15 years. Uh, 28th is the farthest that anybody's ever won from. Okay. Um, the last... 15 years, I don't know the, the top of my head, but probably the top 20. It's it's tough to win past that. Um, probably 15th, 18th, somewhere around there, I would say, was the, the farthest. Um, How many drivers so are normally gonna, competing? 33. 33. Okay. Always 33. I'm going to throw, throw something at you, though. Um, you might remember a guy named Scott Goodyear, who I yep. believe started 33rd yep. and at the time finished second in the closest finish of the Indy 500. So it's that not impossible true. to come from last place to win. And I'm looking at the stats here right now, just from 1996 on, it looks like the lowest um, starting driver who has won here has been 19th. And that was Ryan Hunter oh. Ray. Wow. Okay. And then I also wanted to ask you about, because this is something that, prior to this year in NASCAR, we're, we're always looking at practice and qualifying and the combination and some tracks practice is more important than qualifying. So at this particular race, talk about history, practice to qualifying. And then based on that history, which drivers would you say, keep an eye on these guys. They may not have the best starting position, but they sure look pretty fast in practice. Well, we'll find out the, the true answer to that this weekend, right? Because you, you've seen all, all week, Honda and Chevrolet have had two differing strategies. Everybody says this is a track position race. It's going to be tough to pass. That's unanimous, the, all drivers. But Honda thought, well, if that's the case, we need to start up front. We need to be more dialed into our qualifying pace than our race pace. Chevy thought, well, you know, if, if passing is going to be tough, why don't we make our cars good to pass? Why don't we make sure that that air is less disturbed on our cars where we can pass? Where starting position doesn't matter. Because prior to 2018, with, we remember with that, those aero kits, they were passing all over the place. The record prior to 2012, the most lead changes in a race was 29. Every year since then, we've had at least 29 lead changes. So passing's happened. So they thought, hey, you know what? Why don't we make our cars able to pass? 
where Honda guys are like, hey, you know, I'm not concerned about passing. I want the track position. So this is the year that it's a split field like that. I mean, I took a note earlier. I think out of the top 12 starting spots, 11 of them are Hondas. Out of the bottom 12 mm-hmm. starting spots, 11 of them are Chevys. It's a split field. All right, so um, then then so which we'll of those drivers and which of those Chevys that didn't care as much about qualifying have the best chance? I think Pagano, as we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Connor Daly is another one. Um, he's had a great race car in traffic. I mean, absolutely phenomenal. He was, if you look at his race practices last week, you take the qualifying trim out. You just look at race ninth, fourth, and sixth. He was 18th today, but I don't know how much speed they were looking for. I was watching him in a tow and that guy was taking it anywhere he wanted to go. Um, he starts 18th. His odds are good for starting 18th. Um, so I would, him and Pagano, I'd say would be the top two for their starting spots. And also Elio has looked great. Granted as a one-off, it's hard to win here, but he's won here three times. Nobody active has won here more than that. This is as likely his final start with Penske ever. He, uh, Penske's cut in the sports car program. They want to go to a four cars next year full time. Scott McLaughlin overseas is probably going to be that driver. So Elio was emotional about that. This is probably it. He wants to be full time next year. He's a free agent. Penske's not going to be the place. He's going to look elsewhere. He? He's going to have to look elsewhere. Uh, Forty-two. Now, 43? why? See, that's interesting because you would think, I, I would just think that your re, your your reaction times need to be quicker in the IndyCar series than in stock car racing. Yet sure. the IndyCar drivers can end up older they can race until they're into their 40s we don't see that in stock car racing why is that oh yeah yeah you it's i I think like probably because these guys have started so early they've owned their skills um and veterans and indycar mean a lot just like nascar but i think there's more loyalty in the owners here they're not trying to rush to get the youngest guy how old's jimmy johnson some of these drivers uh, he's in his forties as well. Uh, I think he's 44. Okay. And, uh, what was Jeff Gordon when he retired? Sam 43, okay. I think. When you got to look at Jimmy Johnson, I, I think he's going to be an IndyCar next year. He, he mentioned that he, he is going to run if he's allowed, finds a, a team, which what team is not going to take this on. He wants to run all 12 or 13 rotor street courses. Um, he so he said, I'm not retiring from racing. I'm just retiring full time from NASCAR. So he loved this test out here. So, again, you got a guy that NASCAR in, in the 40s is treated like a dinosaur over here. We're like, come on sure. over. Um, and, you know, once he gets here, in IndyCar normal schedule, all the races up to the 500 are typically road and street courses. One of them leading in is the GP here. Once he's here, you know, if he starts running well, he's not getting out of that car. He's going to run full time. He'll run the 500. So, yeah, guys in their 40s, um, as Bobby Rahal told me, really, you don't feel like indie car drivers and most most drivers in general they don't even start hitting their their early peak years till 27 28 and he feels like they're there into their early 40s denny hamlin's a prime example he he didn't start getting hot until these last couple of years marco andretti said the same thing yesterday his grandpa mario drove into his 50s out here and mario told him maybe you're just getting started maybe you're just finally starting to get it this could just be the start of something how about uh, hamlin how old so is he yeah 39, I think, 40. So he's right. 39. I believe he's 39. Is there a then age? Like, is, is, isn't is that a little un, a little old, though? Isn't that a little bit unusual for, for a driver to, to, to reach? Oh, now I am in my peak at 39. It is, but it's that's the experience factor. I think these guys say with the experience, you get teamed with the right engineer, or crew chief, like Marcus said last year his engineer in his car, which be the the term for IndyCar as a crew chief. Um, he was an Indy lights guy. He never had any IndyCar experience. And so he comes along, um, wasp over here. <laughs> Don't get, gosh, dang it. All right. Anyway, yeah, I'm not, sure, sh- I'm not so here. sure you should be swatting wasps unless you know, you're going <laughs> to probably, you know, you got the death nail. Uh, yeah. it may not be a good idea, but go ahead. Proceed, Eric. I think he wanted to come on the show, That's I guess. More um, the merrier. Uh, <laughs> yeah, come on in, Mr. Ross. Uh, anyways, uh, 
Yeah, it's a, it's like Marco's engineer didn't have Indy Lights experience. He gets pe- or Indy car experience. He only had Indy Lights. He gets paired with this this guy he's on now who had a lot of Indy car experience, and it just gels. It's clicking. Same with Hamlin. Gets gets paired with Chris Gabehart. Their experience together works. Um, so sometimes it might take a while that experience factor, and, and, and it's, it's a momentum sport. It's comfort. Once you get it, it's hard to lose. And I think that's why you see Denny Hamlin, Kevin Harvick. Truex Jr., Kyle Busch, the same guys in NASCAR competing. Maybe Marco's starting okay. to hear that. I mean, Ray Hall said yesterday, um, he goes, nothing against the Rossies or anybody else in this field, but I know everybody wants to see me and Marco and Ray Hall and Andretti hate each other. It's not our nature, but there's nobody else in this field that's going to move the needle more than a Ray Hall or Andretti winning the race on Sunday. We're both the same age. We both came together, up through the, through the ranks together. And we both have cars to win. So, um, yeah, I feel like the, the age is a factor in this as uh, well. Before we uh, call it a show, what is the situation with any fans? No fans. Zero First fans. Ever. So, uh, no fans. Uh, so, it'll be interesting. There's been fans lining the gates outside, which to me is a little weird because they say they don't want you to congregate together and social distance and wear a mask, but they're closer together there than they would be in here because uh, it's 933 acres inside. So there's going to be a lot of people outside <laughs> the, the gates on Sunday. Um, thousands, I bet. So it's going to be weird. Talked to a lot of drivers about that too, about the emotions. Um, walking through Gasoline Alley here to the garage area, or to the pit road. Um, it's just an emotional time for these guys. It's a dream come true every year to be here. The fans changing your name to look out in the stands and see over 300,000 people, um, is a sight to behold, and you almost have to harness your emotions. You have to bring it down. You have to know, hey, I got a job to do here. I can't be too much on overdrive, for lack of a better word, because I might wreck. I don't want to step out of those boundaries. Um, this year, it's going to be the opposite. You're going to have to build yourself up. Normally, these guys stay at the racetrack, but a lot of them live here in Indy. They're going to go home and sleep in their own beds on Saturday night. Why stay here? The, every morning, there's a, on race morning, there's a 6 a.m. bomb that goes off to signify the gates are open. You're not going to have that this year. These guys, like Kanan said, qualifying day goes, used, I used to stay in the garage because, or in the motorhome behind the garage, because you couldn't get into the track on qualifying morning. You have to fight the fans and sign autographs and take pictures. At least I'm already here. You can get to my car. This year, I live 15 minutes away. I left like 10 minutes before I was supposed to be here. It took me two minutes to walk from my car to where I'm at talking to you. So um, it's going to be different on Sunday. It's going to be uh, a weird atmosphere. All right, let's uh, wrap up with picks. CJ, who would you say you're going to go with? It's a tough one. Honestly, it's a combination of speed and it's a combination of consistency. I'm looking at one of the highest placing uh, Chevrolets in the field because I think the passing at the back is going to make a difference in addition to the strategy. So I'm looking at Joseph Newgarden. All right. And again, he's 10 to 1 right now. Who's your top sleeper, DJ? My top sleeper would actually be Rina's VK for the same reason. I mean, the only reason I'm not choosing him over Newgarden, I mean, he's starting fourth. He is the highest placing um, Chevrolet in terms of qualifying. Uh, the only reason I'm not putting him over Newgarden is that experience factor. And Eric, you said you were going to go with Andretti, right? Going to go with Andretti this year. I feel like this is his year. Um, I think he's going to beat Rossi in a, in a close finish. And considering there were no fans at the racetrack, this would be a good year for Marco Andretti to win in front of nobody. It would be fitting. <laughs> it would certainly be fitting if an Andretti uh, curse ends with no fans in the stands. Yeah. Um, I will say one, my long shot sleeper is Polo, but one guy that we haven't talked about that I think is the best sleeper value in the field, which I haven't looked prior to the show. I looked yesterday. His odds is a uh, Takuma Sato. Yeah. Um, do you have the odds in front of you? 15 right to now? one. There you go. Oh, there you go. Right there in your ABC hat. Yeah. So Sato, he's starting on the front row. He's starting third. Um, there's only one other time in his history here that he started in the top 10. It was 2017. He started fourth and he won. He's got a really good race car. He was fourth on the speed charts today. Um, I just shocked. He was second in the final race practice of the week last week um, on Thursday before they turned the boost up on Friday. Um, he's got track position. Now that guy, his, his motto, he said is no attack, no chance. <laughs> so he will, we saw in 2012, him, him try to pass Dario Franchitti in a lane that I, I don't know where he was going. It's like he was driving to <laughs> Kentucky. It's like, dude, you went way South on the track. You weren't going to make that corner. Um, 
he came from the back last year and he came all the way up to third in the end. So I, I'm shocked he's not getting more play than what he is. So he, as far as the sleeper values, he's my top sleeper. My top long shot would be below. All right. Sounds good. And then uh, next week we have a Dover recap, an Indy 500 recap, and a Daytona preview on our NASCAR show, uh, which will end the regular season in NASCAR. And uh, then we're off to our playoff previews and all that. So it's going to be a busy couple of weeks, uh, kind of starting with the big race, of course, on Sunday. And really, race weekend, you get the two races at Dover. I mean, you picked a really good week uh, for the Indy 500. And Eric, for, Eric, for you to like not even... I mean, you haven't put too much effort into the NASCAR coverage this week, and you really picked no. the perfect week to do that because we all know that Dover <laughs> is not going to really excite us too much. It, it, it won't be any any worse than what we saw on Sunday, but you never know. No. I mean, I'm sure my picks uh, kind of indicate yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I have to put a lot of thought into it. I'm like, hey, look at the odds. I know there's not going to be any sleepers. Hey, it might and, be the best hey, way to do let's it. let's just go to the top two. Absolutely. Yeah. Because that's so, the, that's uh, the way it worked in uh, the race at Daytona, the road course race. The two favorites, well, yep. the one of the favorites won out of the two. So, all right, yep. we'll talk. Keep it we'll going. We'll talk about that next week, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll probably uh, get an opportunity, uh, hopefully, actually, to talk to you on Monday uh, or at some point with a uh, race weekend. Who knows? Maybe even a weekend report where you could talk about everything going on. And I know your schedule is yep. very difficult, but we'll uh, we'll uh, rely on. Uh, you know, anything that you can provide us would be great considering your schedule. I know it's been really busy, but uh, we'll get you back full time next week for our NASCAR coverage. Eric, appreciate it. RaceReviewOnline.com. Yep. I, I would assume you've got a lot of work, a lot of content on the website. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. Um, I wrote last week like 43 articles with all these features because I'll give IndyCar and IMS credit. They are this is the first track that you're allowed to like interview drivers in person and they set up a bullpen out by Gasoline Alley and they just. You, they have an, like an X on the spot, and then, oh, there's my wasp friend. Well, you see, you've you've angered the wasp. I made him. Yeah. Well, I killed him. So oh. He, he tried to sting me. He tried to sting me, but Is I Is there like an organization uh, against insects, PETA-related? <laughs> well, he tried to sting me, so it's self-defense. Okay. He might have yeah, gotten me a little yeah, bit. I don't know. But, I need, uh, I need I to see the first. proof. And you don't even have your mask um, on, so you've killed a wasp without yeah, a mask on. Here. Kill the wasp without a mask on. That stung me first. I think it uh -huh. stung me a little it bit. It doesn't matter. It's not too bad. It could sting you t as long if, as long as it's not a death stung stinging situation. You're in the wrong. True. That's true. That is all true. right. So, so racereviewonline.com. Uh, we'll, we'll you're going to be working on that uh, all the way through to the race and then after the race. Yep. Yep. Uh, absolutely. Got a lot up. Um, maybe have one more tomorrow. Most of my pre-race stuff's done, and then a bunch of recaps after the races. And Rotor Wire, CJ. Rotowire.com. We got the trucks uh, fantasy preview up for tonight's race, and uh, Xfinity and the Cup Series pre fantasy reports previews will be up uh, shortly thereafter today as well. And don't forget, on demand, uh, CG and I had our NASCAR coverage of the Dover race, and we talked a little bit about the Kyle Larson situation and a few other tidbits. So that is available on demand. And uh, next week, we will also talk about uh, the Goodyear situation with NASCAR, maybe a little bit more Kyle Larson talk, get your side of the story, Eric, and much more. So, uh, guys, appreciate it as always. Great job. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Talk Thanks. to you then.